Welcome to Homespun. This is kind of like our, uh, our real television program here in Sioux Center. Uh, four people in Sioux Center, about people in Sioux Center, and, and you're not from Sioux Center, but we are really uh, honored today to have uh, the Iowa Lieutenant Governor, Adam Gregg, with us. And uh, Adam, it's just, just an awesome thing to have you here. Well, thank you. Thank what, are you, you. What, are you what are you doing in our little neck of the woods? Well, you know, it, I don't know if you know this, about 21 days from now, there's kind of a big day coming up. Really? Uh, what is that? It is election day. And so... Uh, oh, that's right. I, I am uh, I'm traveling uh, all around the state pretty regularly these days. Uh, I happen to be in this area today uh, because tomorrow Governor Reynolds uh, has her second debate of the uh, gubernatorial race with Fred Hubble. That'll be in Sioux City. So I'm kind of traveling the state doing some uh, pre-debate uh, media discussions, but also sort of uh, we're, co we're coming close to the finish line here and, and time to, to get out there and, and uh, talk about the great things that are going on in the state, talk about why uh, we think we ought to have another four years to continue in this role. And, and for me, you're right, I'm not from Sioux Center, but I'm not from too far from here. Uh, I grew up in Haywarden, of course. Sure, and married, your, married your high school sweetheart. That's exactly right. So uh, we're both Sioux County natives, and uh, this place certainly holds a very special place in our heart. And uh, so it's always great to find an excuse to get, to get back up here. Sure. And it's nice to have um, the governors, I think, fell upon a real gem when she came upon you. I mean, you, you were... You were born and raised in an area that's very strong as far as the DNR goes and the outdoors and, and uh, just being out with nature. And then you married a, a, a girl who uh, was born and, and raised on a century farm halfway between where? Hayward and... and Hayward, between Hayward and, uh, and Sioux Center, uh, the Raider family operates a century farm that her dad is a part of and her, her uncles, her two uncles are a part of, her brother's now a part of it. So. We're pretty, uh, we're pretty proud of them. So I'm sure you've gotten a scoop on if they've been in it 100 years, they've had the, uh, the the ups and the downs. And the downs were very destructive back in the 70s, 80s, things like this. I'm sure you've probably heard the stories. Absolutely. And, and, and my own grandfather, Glenn Gregg, who uh, was a World War II veteran, he recently passed away, but he was also a major cattle feeder uh, in in the Hayward area, and so he definitely lived through those ups and downs as well, and was a, a leader in his industry. And so, um, you know, that's that's part of farming. It, what's the old joke? It was the first legalized gambling. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, his farming in the state of Iowa, and yeah. so, uh, but you know, I, I appreciate having been born and raised uh, here in, in, in Sioux County. Where we're so proud of our agricultural heritage, where we quite literally feed and fuel the world right here in Sioux County, and, and it's nice to, to be in an area where folks understand that. Sure, sure. Now, Adam, a little bit about you. Where did you Where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? At? So, after graduating from West Sioux in Hayward, I went to Central College down in Pella. Okay. Uh, played football there for all, right. all four years, and I uh, really enjoyed uh, playing at that level. Now. I always say I was Division Six talent, but I had the opportunity to play Division Three, and so uh, really appreciated that. Um, while I was there, worked hard, got good grades, graduated number one in my class. I had the opportunity to go to Drake Law School, uh, studied at Drake in Des Moines for three years, and then worked at a, a law firm for a couple of years. Then had the opportunity, uh, and this is really where I got to know Governor Reynolds before she was governor. I uh, had the opportunity to join the Branstad Reynolds Governor's Office as a policy advisor and as their legislative liaison and, and really the person who worked with the legislature on their behalf uh, to get the budget passed, to get their policy agenda passed. Um, so worked with them uh, in that role, ran for Attorney General in 2014, lost, but then was appointed as the state public defender. What? What happened here in the state of Iowa that we couldn't come up with a Republican candidate uh, to run against that attorney general this year? You know, I think some of that may just be that I worked really hard and gave him a run for his money and wasn't able to win in 2014. And sure. so, um, you know, I don't, I don't know why no, nobody stepped up, but uh, maybe they just felt like, hey, if Adam couldn't get it done, I'm not sure I can get it done either. <laughs> well, um, and, but you know, I look back on all that. And I definitely see God's plan at work. Sure. Because I look back and I think there's a reason I ran for Attorney General in 2014, and there's a reason I lost. You know, if I hadn't run, 
I probably, I definitely wouldn't have had the opportunity to campaign all across the state with then Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, right. and perhaps wouldn't have risen in her eyes as somebody who could be a partner if, if she ever became governor. Sure. But you know, if I hadn't lost, I wouldn't have been in a position to take this position, to take this role uh, as Lieutenant Governor, and I also wouldn't have gotten the really. Uh, important experience of having led the state public defender's office right, um, right. for two and a half years, which I, I definitely learned a lot serving in that role, and I think I, it um, allows me to add more value sure. in my role as lieutenant governor, having been a member of the cabinet before that. Right. Now, is Governor Reynolds, is she pretty easy to get along with, or is she pretty hard to lose? No, uh, she, is, uh, she is just as, as you'd expect. She's a very warm, kind person. Um, she is... Uh, somebody that I am really honored to work side by side with. Uh, she really benefited from the fact that when she was serving as Lieutenant Governor with Governor Branstad, he had her involved in every decision from day one. Sure. So when the, that transition of power happened in May of 2017, there was no hiccup in government service. There was no uh, major issues because she knew what was going on and she, right. she'd been prepared for that. Well, it was, it was not, seamless. It, it was, was pretty seamless uh, was. for the state, and I think that was uh, eased a lot of tensions for a lot of people uh, who were kind of holding their collective breaths when that happened. Exactly. Um, and, and you know, and the, and the point I was getting to there is she's been gracious to allow me to be able to serve in that way with her. Right. To have me in from day one and aware of the thought process and the rationale of all the decision, uh, all the decisions that are made. And, you know, she's, of course, ultimately the final decision maker on all those things, but right. she's interested in my opinion and perspective on those things. She allows me to, to be a part of that process and, to give, you know, it gives me uh, the ability to, to know what's going on and if there ever were a situation down the road where either an opportunity comes up for her or, or even something tragic, you got to be prepared. Right. And, you know, I've come to learn that not every state does it that way. So you you may, well, you go into this position knowing that you're being groomed for governor if that would happen. Well, it's a matter of um, being prepared in the event that ever happened. That's, that's the most important part of sure. the role of lieutenant governor. Sure. Here in West Michigan, we are, um, we are ag predominantly agricultural. Here in Sioux Center, we're very progressive as far as, um, you know, on the grow. Our, our college is one of the... Uh, biggest growing colleges in a time when colleges are on the decline. Um, we see a lot of that here. Um, what are your, what are some of the things that you know about us? And what are the things that you, that you can do for us going in another uh, couple of years as governor? Yeah, well, having grown up around here, I know quite a bit about the area. I think of some of the lessons that I learned about what made me who I am that I feel I took from having grown up in Sioux County and in the community of Hayward, but in the broader community of Northwest Iowa. Right. Things like um, revering family, things like loving God, things like being good stewards, things like service to your community, sure. things like um, serve, you know, love of country. Uh, all those things are elements of the community uh, that we're in here today. You know, Governor and I are really passionate about rural prosperity. Sure. Having both come from small towns, Governor grew up in St. Charles, which is a small town in South Central Iowa. I, of course, grew up in this neck of the woods. So we're very passionate about making sure that there's opportunity and prosperity available in every corner of our state. Because you might say we come from those corners. Yes. yes. Uh, and also, thinking, and you think about a community like Sioux Center, uh, where, as you just described, there is opportunity, there is prosperity, there is growth. Um, we're thinking about what we can do to, to learn from communities like Sioux Center and others that are thriving and that are vibrant, and how can we help other communities that are struggling a little more to be more like that and be able to open up that kind of opportunity and prosperity. So how are we doing that? Well, Governor signed an executive order back in July, creating the Governor's Empower Rural Iowa and she's asked me to co-chair that. Um, and so we've been having, we've called them idea summits in small towns all across the wow, state. That's a great idea. And we, no pun intended. We, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, we challenged 
the task force member, we, so we're part of three task forces and we've had these meetings all across the state. We asked all the task force members, you got to come with an idea, a written idea. That's your ticket in the door. And we're focused on solutions, not identifying problems or complaining about what's not right. Come forward with a positive idea and we'll consider it and, and see if it's something that we can make work. So consequently, we've got dozens and dozens of ideas tackling the biggest issues that we hear about as we travel rural Iowa. Sure, sure. Those things are housing. You know, in rural Iowa, we have a different type of housing crisis than what we had in our country 10 years ago. Right. We've got, the, our crisis in rural Iowa is we don't have enough nice market rate housing to accommodate uh, all the people that want it. And, and, and it's tied really closely to our, our biggest issue in our state, which is that we have more jobs than we have people to fill up. And so part of that is because uh, there isn't enough housing in a lot of our communities for the folks who want to fill those jobs. Uh, so we're working to tackle that issue. Connectivity, that's another big one. Now Sioux Center uh, has a great provider, uh, and so there's, there's really good connectivity in Sioux Center, but that's not true in every community. Right. Right. Um, and that's really important for economic development. It's really important for entrepreneurs to be able to sell their products all across the uh, right. world. And it's also important if we want to keep young people in the rural parts of our state. Uh, they're not going to live, these folks are technology native since birth. They're not going to live somewhere where they can't be connected. Correct. So it's a, it's a quality of life issue as well. Well, I think here too in, in our area, we're kind of a great hub. I mean, we're just a few hours from Omaha, a few hours from Minneapolis, a few hours from Des Moines. Um, you know, we're an arm's length away from Chicago. I mean, we are, and then we're, we're, we're still enjoying that rural feeling here. Um, working and living in Chicago, uh, I've moved from there simply because if I had to do another four hour traffic jam and take another four hours out of my life sitting behind the wheel of my car, I, I wasn't going to make it. You know, I, I talk about this all the time because I always say in Iowa you can have it all. And I think that's especially true in this corner of the state. Sure. You can have a good job, you can have a house with a yard, you can have a very reasonable commute, or no commute at all, uh, in, in many of our small towns. 2.5 uh, kids and a dog. Yeah, all of those things, yeah. you know. But it, you, know, you can also have an impact on your community. You can actually, it, it's a small enough pond where you can have an impact. If you want to get involved, you know, you can step up and run for school board or city council or county, county supervisors, or you know, if you're really lucky, you end up serving in the role of lieutenant governor. Um, that isn't necessarily true in the Chicago's of the world and the New York's. Well, we want to be in a place to where our, where our ideas are heard and where our ideas count. Mm -hmm. um, what you're doing with your idea think tank is brilliant because you're not you're not just doing all the talking; you're doing a lot of the listening. Exactly. And too many politicians, I think, running around today, um, especially in the attacks on one another, they're attacking one another without any solution. Well, that's like going into a doctor's office him telling you what you have and no uh, no prescription for healing. Um, uh, this campaign is different. I can feel it and I can sense it with, with Kim and, and yourself. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is, is sort of positivity, optimism. Uh, this Empower Rural Iowa initiative, is, you, you mentioned listening. Well, it's two levels of listening, really. Number one, and the issues that we identified, that's from listening as we travel and visit all 99 counties every year. But then, with the ideas that we put on the table, you, you might say we're crowdsourcing the ideas on how to improve rural Iowa from the people of Iowa. Right. Um, and so, I just really appreciate that. The other thing is, you know, let's be honest, let's, let's acknowledge where the state truly is. I know there's a lot of doom and gloom on the TV and on, on the radio sometimes, but you know, we're in a pretty good spot in the state of Iowa, and I think a lot of that is attributable to the governor's leadership. Um, first of all, the biggest problem we've got is that we've got more jobs than people to fill them. Right. That's a good problem. That's, well, I know problem, that's our problem up. here in Sioux Center. We just have uh, so many openings. Yeah. And so, uh, that's a cha it's to the point where it's a challenge. Yes. Don't get me wrong, yes. it is a problem. But we're working to resolve that problem with investments and job training, doing a better job of connecting our students to opportunities, even in their K-12 education, that will prepare them to fill those jobs and expose them to the type of opportunities that are available here. You know, we're standing at 2.5% unemployment. We just ended fiscal year 2018 with a $127 million surplus. 
We've got over $600 million in cash reserves. Our investment in education funding has never been higher in the history of the state of Iowa. At the same time, we put together a tax reform bill that is uh, that allows Iowans to keep more of their money, but is also fiscally responsible from the state's perspective so that we can continue to make those types of investments in education. Wages are going up. Uh, just last quarter, uh, on average across the state, it went up by 5.1% wages. That's our third straight quarter of growth from wages. And so almost any measure that you can come up with to, to measure how the state's doing, uh, we're excelling in. Sure. And that leads me to another big one, which is U.S. News and World Report added up all these numbers from all the different states. Eight different categories, 77 different metrics, tens of thousands of data points. And when they added all those up, they found that Iowa was the number one state in the nation. Yes. They don't have a dog in the fight politically. They're not for Republicans or Democrats, and they don't care if it's Governor Reynolds or if it's Fred Hubble. They just looked at the numbers and crunched the numbers. And uh, to me, that's a pretty darn good third-party validator. Right. When, uh, when you've got an, an entity like that, uh, which just looks at the numbers and follows the numbers. Correct. And, and um, not only that, but for Sioux Center here, I know we were, we were voted as the number, number one safest uh, city in the state. Uh, Iowa has been just listed as one of the top places in the nation to retire. Um, and speaking about retirement, you're talking about housing there. Um, one of the problems that we have now that we didn't have 20, 30, 40 years ago, and it's going to get even worse, is, it, oh, I shouldn't say the word worse, but it's going to be, it's going to be a More challenge, time. is uh, the fact that our elderly are living uh, longer and they're living more quality lives. And so we're going to have to have more uh, you know, more more housing for the seniors and more programs for the seniors and, and uh, extending the life of their careers a little bit. Yeah, well, I think it's a, uh, while, while it may be a challenge, it's also a huge opportunity because we've got folks, yes, they're living longer, so I think that also, particularly in an area like this, that means people are going to want to contribute to their communities longer. Sure. And it's it, more, well, more voters, I suppose, uh, but also just more, more folks who are willing to, to help out and make the community better. We just had this conversation at one of our idea summits, actually, last Friday down in Pella. We had this conversation because there's a lot of talk about how um, we want to develop a next generation of leadership for our communities, which often means getting younger people involved. And uh, one of the things that we talked about is to say, let's not forget about the older folks in our communities either because they still want to be engaged, they still are going to live there, right. and, and so it shouldn't be, you know, to the exclusion of young or old, we need to make sure that we've got a good cross-section represented around the table as communities think about what they're going to look like going forward. Right. Now I know that there's a big debate coming in the next few days. Um, Hubble is going to debate against uh, the governor. Um, what do you anticipate in that debate? Well, I think it'll be uh, 